So yeah, we're really, really thrilled to have you. Um, if you have joined us from outside of the Pebble community, um, just a quick note that Pebble is the UK's leading uh, sustainable living magazine, and we uh, an online magazine at pebblemag.com. And you can find us um, on all of our social media channels. And we talk about everything from food waste to eco travel to ethical fashion to talking about algae. And we were just having a, a fascinating chat about slugs before we, <laughs> we joined you. Um, so anything and everything that you uh, want to know about living a more sustainable life, um, you can find on Pebble. And actually, this is part of our new Sea Change series. So we're spending three months to the end of June um, talking about soil health and permaculture. Um, food and farming systems, and this is a big part of, of our uh, thing. Um, if you've got your mics on, can you turn them off? Um, let me see. Uh, give me a second um, yeah, just keep them off, otherwise we'll get a bit of feedback, um, and that would be lovely. Um, please do pop in the chat. Uh, where you're from it'd be great to see who we've got uh, in here I know we've got people from all over the world which we're really really thrilled about um, and fantastic that you're also interested in building building a sustainable food system um, but before we move on um, to the to the main session I'll get our panelists to introduce themselves um, so Ed you're to my right so I'm going to get you to go first <laughs> Thanks, Georgina. Uh, yeah, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. So my name's Ed, and I am the Sustainability and Farming Communications Manager for Abel & Coal. Uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, but it basically encapsulates uh, the fact that I keep my fingers in all sorts of pies. Uh, it was a great way to get assistant out the job title too. But it means that if we talk about our sustainability, or if we talk about our farmers, if we talk about soil health, biodiversity, wildlife, um, it's generally got my prints on it. <clears throat> So who are Abel & Coal? We've been going for about 33 years. We are described as one of the original veg box companies, um, but we do so much more than just fruit and veg. We specialize in organic. So we have an organic sourcing policy where, uh, which, which states that uh, if it's organic, you know, we'll source it. Um, and yeah, it's just an, it's a real pleasure to be here. I, um, as the job title suggests, it's something that I love talking about, building sustainable food systems. And it really is wonderful to see such an international crowd here. I'd uh, underestimated how international tonight's going to be but so uh, yeah it's great to be here i've just got to say it's an absolute pleasure to be sharing a, a digital stage with both bella and patrick i've been a, a bit of fan of the sft and sustain alliance for for years now they're both amazing resources for our company and our brand so it's wonderful to be here yeah thank you ed there's so many wonderful people out there building these uh, food systems so it's brilliant to bring everyone together because i know everyone also has slightly different opinions on lots of different topics and that's what i think makes it so interesting um, Bella, do you want to go next? Hello. Hi there, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, so my name's Bella Dreesen and I work at Sustain, uh, the Alliance for Sustainable Food and Farming, and I help run campaigns for sustainable food places. So that's our network of uh, food partnerships across the UK, and we run that in association with um, Soil Association and Food Matters. Uh, so I help support campaigns that we run through that, including Good to Grow, which is a national network of community gardens. So I've spent the last decade involved in the food system as sort of more than just someone that eats food uh, in one way or another, first on community gardens as a volunteer and project manager. Uh, and then I spent two years training as an organic market gardener. And then I sort of got my nerd hat back on uh, and I, I went and studied at the Environmental Change Institute um, before working as a research assistant at the Food Research Collaboration, which is based at the Centre for Food Policy. So I'm really passionate about food justice, climate justice and um, taking the sort of whole systems approach to food and farming that we do at Sustain and um, really working at a local and national level, which is which is what um, Sustainable Food Places is all about as well. So thanks very much for having me. Um, really looking forward to it. Thank you so much. And I think that's what's going to be so interesting, um, your your experience in both the very local and, and massive policy level, um, because there's often lots of different stories going on and, and different things being pulled in different directions. Um, Patrick, we're so thrilled that you can uh, join us as well. Patrick's the, the, um, the founder of the Sustainable Food Trust. Um, do you want to give us a little introduction to you, Patrick? Uh, okay, um, I'm an ancient hippie, uh, a Londoner who got back to the land at the end of the 60s, uh, beginning of the 70s, set up a, um, a commune, uh, which was also a, a sustainable farm, mm -hmm. Uh, which is today still going after 50 years next year. Um, 
uh, we're based in West Wales. We farm about 300 acres. We have a dairy herd of about 90 Ayrshire cows, the milk from which, 90% of the milk from which is made into cheese on the farm. Cheese called Havod, and that's where, if you want to follow us at the farm, it's at Havod Cheese, uh, which is uh, Welsh, by the way, H-A-F-O-D, pronounced V, Havod. And um, we've been trying to farm sustainably for most, of, well, all of that time, and we're now the longest established organic mm. dairy farm in Wales. Uh, I've had a couple of day jobs, uh, the first of which is running the soil, no, well, before that even, but the most significant of which was running the Soil Association for about... 20 years, uh, 15 of which I was the director. And then uh, since then, 2010, set up the Sustainable Food Trust, which is a smaller organization with a mission of accelerating the transition to sustainable food systems working internationally. And uh, the report that we're just working on at the moment is called Feeding Britain from the Ground Up. And it's basically kind of exercise where we've tried to work out how much food will be produced if um, uh, if the whole country was transitioned to regenerative and sustainable farming systems uh, and then work out what that diet would look like. So we can talk about more of that in a minute. Definitely. And I think that's one of the, the reasons I was so keen to, to have you on board this evening, because I know you've done some of the most up to date research that there is um, in what makes a sustainable food system, especially for sort of Europe, the European and, and British um, landscapes. Um, and I thought, you know, there's actually no three better people we could pull together. So I'm super excited as well. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I mean, we, the, we posed a big question, you know, what makes a sustainable food system? And I guess one place to start is looking at the opposite. So what makes an unsustainable food system? Because that's probably where we are for the most part. Would, would you guys agree? Yeah, there's some, there's some nodding. What's... What do you think for the moment is the most unsustainable part of our sort of food and farming system? I can jump in there. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm a warm up act for Bella and Patrick. But um, <laughs> so I, I would say that and I'm going to give two examples of, of, of back this up. I think artificially propping up um, inefficient systems is, is the most unsustainable thing that we do. And there's two examples that have really come to mind recently. And that's first is using artificial fertilizers on soil. Now, there is a time and a place for artificial fertilizers, as in you know, hydroponics or growing underground, for example. But when you're using them on soil, you're mm. masking the inefficiencies of your system. And probably a, the, the example, probably a better example that, um, that really brings us to life is uh, feeding grain to cattle as well. So we've just started working with um, a couple of farmers who are PFLA, 100% pasture, pasture raised, and they're certified by the PFLA to, um, to, to, as an assurance of that. And it really kind of brought it home how how much you can mask the inefficiencies of something with these with these inputs, quite damaging inputs sometimes. You know, you look at the effect of artificial fertilizers on soil um, and and waterways. So you know, eutrophication, acidification, all these things come come from our liberal applications of synthetic nitrogen. And it's the same with feeding grain to cattle. So there is nothing stopping so nothing stopping these farmers that we work with from raising their cattle hundred percent on healthy pasture and when you start introducing grain into that into that system you're not you're kind of you're hiding the inefficiencies of your system now when you look at a measure of fertility soil organic carbon if you want to raise cattle on nothing but healthy pasture you have to make sure that pasture is at peak fertility peak productivity for as much of the year as possible peak productivity equals peak carbon sequestration so by putting cattle on land, you are, um, you know, if your if your stocking density is correct and you have encouraged biodiversity in the right way, then you really shouldn't need to be adding grain to that system. If you're adding grain to that system, you're masking those inefficiencies. You're no longer aware of where the shortfalls are, and it's the same with artificial fertilizers. We shouldn't have to use them. So for me, there's two great examples of how we're propping up inefficiencies. Hi, right, this is Gwen. Yes. Um. No, I, th I think that's that's um, a really good place to start. And it, we're starting kind of at the farming end, which is what I think is so exciting about having the, the three of you and what we're talking about this evening is we're going from core farming through the system into sort of consumers and, and edge your, your sort of at both ends aren't you? Um, of that and the, sort of the growing individual growing side as well. Um, with Bella, would you would you say from the sort of more community garden led from the from the local level? 
what's the sort of one of the more unsustainable things that we can we can look to try and work on? Well, I suppose um, from that perspective, I, I suppose what I'd be tempted to, to think about when thinking more from the local perspective is sort of starting to unpack that idea of sustainability um, a little bit, um, because it absolutely really importantly uh, refers to sort of the environmental impact, but deals with a lot of social and economic issues as well, which which can become really obvious at that sort of local community scale. So, so absolutely, it's it's not sustainable to be producing food in a way that's degrading habitats and polluting water sources and eating away at our remaining carbon budget um, with the terrible consequences that that has for people all around the world. But nor is it sustainable to be sort of have a food system where food labor is valued so little that um you know slavery still exists uh nor can the food system be sustainable if millions of adults in the uk are missing meals and millions of children that 2.6 million children live in households experiencing food insecurity not to mention hunger levels elsewhere in the world so so there are all these different ways that the food system is unsustainable that is really impacting people on on sort of a personal level and at that that local scale and I think if I had to kind of point to to one thing in the food system where all these things overlap I think uh just the sheer wastefulness of the way the food system's set up at the moment really comes to mind because we do we do have abundance we do have abundance and there is more than enough food being produced but there are sort of unbalanced power structures at play that are keeping people hungry and that's putting food to waste before it even leaves the farm and and alongside that you know it's putting to waste the huge amounts of energy embedded in in that food um and the carbon emissions as a result of that uh you know and and that speaks a lot to the way food's kind of seen as a, a commodity more than a right and we're moving away from the idea that people well we haven't moved towards the idea that that food might be a right um and that people have the right to not have their lives and livelihoods put at risk by the climate impacts of that food system either and um you know i think this is an interesting topic to get get onto it at, when we're thinking about the local level when we're talking about waste because you know i i really really applaud the efforts that that food banks and other local charities have made in keep keeping people fed in recent years but as a society it's it's not enough to simply move bits of waste around to save some carbon here and there and to keep a few people um you know one more meal away from hunger so i think you know a, a lot of this is about really reimagining the whole food system without that waste so we've got that abundance shared and so people can have the dignity of choice and access to culturally appropriate culturally appropriate food access to land to grow their own food if that's what they want to do and you know once we start thinking about what we're wasting what we shouldn't be wasting then then you know that absolutely ties in all those questions about soil that's being wasted and degraded because of these farming practices ed's talking about or um you know fossil fuels being wasted and yeah so back to that propping up the fakes of, of things of sticking plasters isn't it sticking yeah plasters, adding more fertilizer sticking you know food banks essentially are sticking plasters that we shouldn't have to use and need um and their, their temporary stop gap so i think this this in this unwillingness to actually fix a system and just try and tinker in bits of it is, is kind of a, a theme that's already emerging um patrick i'm sure you know you could talk for hours on what is unsustainable in our current food system um but especially from farmers i mean you must have so much first-hand knowledge of of what what isn't working um for people who who make our food and grow our food yeah i think but i think we've got to you know feel some sort of empathy with the situation farmers most farmers find themselves in because they've sort of become commodity slaves uh following you know ever downward price pressures from supermarkets and other food companies that buy their products as a result of which they've been forced to intensify for many, many years, and indeed the intensification has been subsidized by successive governments. And I suppose it all goes back to sort of the middle of the 20th century, uh, after the Second World War, when uh, fertilizer, chemical fertilizer, ammonium nitrate is the sort of uh, main ingredient of, of fertilizers, which was manufactured with a process called the Harbour Bosch process, which was basically used to manufacture explosives during the Second World War. And so there are all these 
uh, factories producing ammonium nitrate for uh, explosives. And then they became widely available after the war. And then because of the, uh, the food insecurity during the war, when you know everybody was dig digging for victory and the U-boats were sinking the submarines, they, the government said, we must never be hungry again. And for the first time, we had all these chemicals available, which everyone thought was OK. Well, not everyone, but a lot of people thought were OK. And amazingly, you could just put on nitrogen fertilizer and grow two blades of grass where one grew before. And the government was subsidizing all the products. And the rest is kind of history. So we're right at the end of sort of a 60, 70 year chapter of agricultural history where farmers use nitrogen fertilizers to stimulate growth, which it does. Uh, but then they found that the crops grown that way were more vulnerable to fungal and disease and uh, attacks and also weed problems. Because if you just grow monocultures year after year, you get pest disease and weeds. But luckily, or unluckily, the chemists came along and they invented all these fungicides, uh, pesticides and herbicides to control all these weeds and pests and diseases. And the farmers, meanwhile, got addicted to this because when you use nitrogen fertilizer, as Ed said, it depresses the biological activity of the soil, the fungi and the microorganisms. So it kind of induces an addiction. And at the same time, prices were going down. And we're right at the end of that um, chapter now, where our soil fertility is nearly exhausted, where public health is declining, because I think the industrialization of agriculture has caused a lot of the problems we're seeing with you know, obesity, diabetes, cancers, diseases of the health and immune system, food intolerances. I think an awful lot of these go back to agricultural practice. And now more and more people are worried about this and everyone's woken up the climate change thing. And now of course Ukraine and fertilizers a thousand pounds a ton. And there's not a farmer now in the country who's thinking what on earth shall I do? So I think we, you know, the concerned public need to help farmers go on a transition because I honestly think that most of them are willing to do that now. They just need to sort out what, how they should change because there's a massive amount of confusion, I think, amongst the public about what we should eat and what kind of farming systems we should support for the future. Absolutely. And, and I think that's part of the reason why there's been so much interest in the event this evening, because I think everyone wants to do the right thing. And I think we've moved beyond seeing farmers as sort of you know, farmers should be our partners, we should be championing them, we should be supporting them, but how do we do that in a meaningful way that helps not just one or two sort of, you know, farmers, but actually do it in a, in a sort of more wide scale manner. Um, there's a fantastic book, um, English Pastoral by James... Brilliant. Or, James. Uh, is it Rebanks? Or, yeah. Yeah, um, which talks so movingly about the plight of, of British farmers over the last 70 years, the whole period that Patrick's just discussed. Um, so if you want to, read, to learn more about that, I, I definitely recommend that. Um, all of you have sort of touched on this fact that fundamentally the building blocks that we build our food system on are, are broken and almost like a bit like a drug. You know, farmers have kind of got addicted to this, this, um, these, sub, these um, ingredients that are causing us all a lot of harm. And harm environmentally and harm harm sort of socially in, in um, people as well. Because of where we are in the in the world, what should we be growing? Patrick, you sort of touched on this right at the beginning with your report. But sort of, what are very sort of basic levels should um, should farmers be growing? What what should we be looking for? What kind of ingredients should we be supporting? Even if that's the smallest way that we can help start to change that system. It's not a small way, it's a huge way. And I think you know, there's no one, as you say, is not asking the question, what should I eat? And I think the answer is we should eat what the sustainable farmers of the future will produce when they switch and in those proportions. And to try to answer that question, which I didn't know the answer, the next question is, well, what is that diet? So, cause we didn't know, we thought, oh, let's commission a report. So we're kind of near the end of this report research which is basically dividing the UK into different regions, because obviously I farm in West Wales and it's high rain and lots of grass and, you know, it's, it can't grow some of the crops that can grow on the most fertile lands. Whereas in the eastern counties where you've got these very rich, fertile soils, you can grow much more, a greater variety of arable crops. So we've basically done this, been putting together this report, which is calculating how much food and of which proportions would be produced if the whole of the UK 
a transition to regenerative organic sustainable chooser term systems and this could this study should be done for every country in the world really because every country's got the same challenge and every, i don't think there's a citizen on the planet who's not asking this question now and so then if you divide the total productivity by the number of citizens, you get a diet. And I think an awful lot of people think, because there's been so much sort of stuff going on, oh, we've all got to eat to a plant-based diet, move to a plant-based diet. And plant-based is dominating all the things. And I listen to heart radio when I'm putting out the silage on my farm, and it goes, oh, Mac plant and this, that, and the other. But actually, a lot of the farmers, we, we are a nation of grass. Two thirds of all the agricultural land is pasture. And actually, pasture as ed mentioned is is a brilliant food uh for cattle and sheep and they've been so demonized because of their methane emissions but actually if you treat the grassland right it draws down carbon from the atmosphere which can offset the methane emissions so i think cows have had a lot of bad press so sh sh very short summary answer what would be what would our diet look like uh we'd heart we'd less we produce less than half the grain that we're producing at the moment we all switch because you you have to build fertility through crop rotations and then that means you grow less grain and also the yields are lower without nitrogen fertilizers so we'd have to give up feeding grain to intensively house livestock which i think would be a very good thing so it's the end of cheap chicken uh it's much more expensive eggs as we're already seeing because of the ukraine crisis um it's no more mega dairies from cows that never get out to grass it's lots of vegetables and fruit grown hopefully in crop rotations in mixed farming systems. And yes, it is quite a lot of grass fed and mainly grass fed red meat, that means beef and lamb, but also good quality dairy products. So it's not about just moving to a plant-based diet. It's also about giving up the plants that are grown unsustainably. Mm -hmm. And that means palm oil, it means GM soy, it means avocados grown from God knows where on the other side of the planet. All these plants that everybody's you know thinking are part of the solution some of them are and some of them aren't and we need to we need to be experts on which plants are part of the problem and which are part of the solution the same with livestock i think that's that's absolutely where we sort of sit as a as a, as a magazine it's, it's that kind of working out what's best for you where you are on the planet not just moving wholehearted you know not there's no easy solution is there there's no easy swap and i think as much as consumers really want there to be actually, if we're going to do this properly, and we're going to support this, this systemic change, then we all need more education, we all need more resources, and we need to make these complex decisions, or, yeah, or find our way through these complex decisions. Somebody's asking the chat, well, you know, maybe I'm sort of demonising avocados. Uh, and, you know, if you buy them from the country where they're grown, that's fine. But, you know, ask yourself this question. Yes, I mean, I don't want to give up tea, coffee, bananas, and exotic stuff grown in countries where uh, it's right, the climate's right, but surely in relation to our staples, so we're not, be, we're not trying to be nanny state about telling people what to eat, but surely for food, lots of good reasons, in relation to our staple foods, we should try to derive as much of our proteins and fats and calories from uh, our homeland, wherever that is. And if you live in Mexico, and I'm not arguing we should give up eating avocados, I just don't think they should be the staple part of our diet. And I think, um, uh, Ed, are you seeing consumers sort of, I mean, you obviously must have so much data on what consumers are wanting to put in their, their, their veg boxes and what they're ordering. And are you seeing people want to move wholeheartedly into vegan and plant-based? Are you seeing people looking for local? What's your sort of sense of where, where people, how much education and how much knowledge is there about these, this sort of more complex food system? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so we are seeing a, a burgeoning interest in plant-based and vegan uh, vegan options. So, so we, we 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 curate the boxes for people, and this is the best thing about the veg box is that about the veg box, veg box schemes, particularly when you offer as many as we do, is that they offer an outlet for gluts and seasonality. Seasonality, I think, is a word that gets banded around a bit too often. Um, I think my company is, is, is as guilty of that of, as, a, as a lot, but the veg boxes are without a shadow of a doubt about as seasonal as they get. And I think being able to kind of to say to people, um, this is this is what's available at the moment. This is how it's being produced. I think if you if you if you justify it and you bring people on the on, on the story with you, then there's no reason they shouldn't understand you know, what you're trying to achieve. I think that we have our tribe 
and it takes a very particular kind of customer to put up with a lot of the nuances of our uh, of our business. So the fact that we don't offer delivery slots, um, you know, the fact that uh, that we don't mind putting wonky veg into boxes. So I think that we're very lucky in the fact that we've got a, a customer base that's very bought into our purpose. But um, but I think it's uh, yeah for me the, the the key kind of the key thing to 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 bear in mind is that we need to be injecting diversity into our into our foods. This is what we this is what we need. We need to be eating kind of you know more diverse foods. We need to be growing more diversity. I think there's resilience in diversity. But what Patrick alluded to there is you know the, the staples. I think that is the word that whenever people get caught up in oh you can't tell me not to eat avocados patrick's absolutely right it's the staples that we need to be worrying about so i'm going to take that patrick thank you for that um definitely and i think as well that, that leads into this sort of idea that how much of our food should you know local seems to be king in what we're saying and the answers and you're the, checking the provenance and it's about the quality of the farms rather than the actual you know wholesale moving away from dairy or, or, or sort of wiping out entire ingredient sections out of our diets um, Bella, are you sort of seeing, is local always the sort of the best option for people if they're sort of trying to make a, a good decision about what to buy um, or put in their basket? Uh, it's a really good question. And I think actually, um, I, I worry that sometimes we put too much emphasis on an individual's decision uh, when they're in the shops, because it's really, it's really, really hard to make those kind of decisions. And actually, from from a purely climatic perspective, local isn't isn't always best. And in the cases where it is best, local isn't always currently available. And in cases where it is available, it can be a lot more expensive. And so, I think. I don't know if I don't think we're at the stage where we can be talking even about consumer choice uh, because I I don't think the farming system is in place and I don't think the I it, you know there's a cost of living crisis on <laughs> and like weighing up the sort of climatic implications the sort of local economic implications uh, of those food decisions you're making when in a lot of cases you probably just counting the pennies of of your food shop is a is a massive massive choice to put on people especially when even the experts are still kind of arguing about about whether that's correct or not like it, it's it's really really complex and and I I think it's I think it's a I think it's more of a government's and a society's responsibility to 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 put those systems in place to give people the 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 positive choices to make instead of putting them in a really, really tricky position um, uh, with, with really, really complex data to get their head around and expect them to be able to make a good choice. And, and that does worry me. And I, and I think as well, when we talk about the food system that we're moving towards and saying that we need to accept that certain things will become more expensive, but they need to be a really big part of our diet. I think those are, those are messages we really need to check in on when when people are going hungry that we're saying like oh well the new food system like you need to carry on eating meat but it's going to be expensive that's that's quite a that's quite a scary message to be saying about a, the food system that we want to build towards and and I think we need to think about some of the wider structures that we build into that to make sure that everyone's accessing those things they need um so I'm sorry that doesn't quite answer, <laughs> answer no, it's almost like we're going to end up with two food systems we're going to end up with a food system that is more sustainable um and is more organic maybe and people should have the have the luxury of choice and supporting farmers and, and doing all the things they want to do and then a second food system for people that can't access that from a from a budgetary point of view does that sort of do, do Ed and, and Patrick, do you sort of feel the same way? Is is cost going to become a bigger barrier to actually shifting to the system that we need? Well, I've got maybe what I don't know if you'll think this is controversial, Bella, but I mean, I'll just say it anyway. I mean, if let's take the energy crisis, and you know, in yesterday's headlines, it was that forty percent of the uh, the general public are going to fall into the category of uh, energy poverty. Uh, next, as soon as next winter, uh, because you know th the price of energy has just gone up so much because of Ukraine on top of everything else, 
that it's uh, it's really hitting lower income households. And I predict that exactly the th same thing is going to happen to food. It's already starting to happen. I mean, I was on a call with the NFU and all the other farming group leaders the other day, and somebody said, oh, it's predicted, I think it was a supermarket that said, food prices are going to go up by 15%, you know, in the coming months. And I, and George Eustace, the environment secretary, is on the call. And I said, I don't think it's going to be 15%. I think it could be as high as 50%. Because the, what, the energy crisis, and all the other inputs that farmers use have gone up so much that they're just, you know, it's just going to be a huge shock to the system. And I think your question, Bella, is exactly right. What are we going to do about the people who are going to be, uh, for whom food and energy is going to become unaffordable, which both of which should be basic rights. And I think the honest answer is governments have to step in. And another point that it comes out of that discussion is that if we buy, let's say, a pound's worth of food in a supermarket today, that is a dinner, dishonest price. The true price of the food that we're paying in the super, buying the supermarkets at the moment that is mostly produced intensively is probably at least double and possibly triple what we're actually paying because we're not paying for the environmental damage, the destruction of soil, uh, the damage to public health. So I think we have to get used to much higher food prices and we have to really face the fact that um, food affordability is going to be a huge issue for maybe 25% of society. And I think that's what governments are for. We need green food stamps. We need, you know, to put a, a shelter in to protect people from food poverty. But if we want to carry on deluding ourselves that we can continue to buy food at below its true cost, I don't think that's the right choice. And I know that's a difficult thing to say, particularly right now when everybody's really facing difficulty. But I think it's the truth. Well, I think I think you're I'm not going to disagree with you because I think actually in theory, that's absolutely where we should be moving to anyway, right? We, we want to move away from an unsustainable food system. We want to move away from cheap prices and cheap meat and industrial dairy and all these things that you guys are so, you know, are so on top of. And I think the will is there, but if the budget isn't there, then we get stuck. You know, we get stuck repeating the same patterns. And actually it's not the fault of the consumer anymore it's not the fault of the farmer having to sell milk for less than they it costs to produce it because of the supermarket so actually the only other bits in the middle are the big big retailers and government um and i think it's it's absolutely right that that there has to be uh, a, a, as bella said a more societal uh, yeah. change yeah um, it's interesting that uh, the supermarkets at the moment are, are trying to keep food prices low as a result of which, you know, the egg, it's been in the news, the egg producers are having to give up. So I think we're beginning to see a huge a change in farming production caused literally by the sort of repercussions of the Ukraine war, which is uh, ironically enough, accelerating uh, the changes which needed to happen anyway. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but it's just one of the sort of weird consequences of the sudden interruption of fossil fuel energy and all the other things that you know, people are going short of because of the war and how we adjust. I think it's a huge, big, should be a massive public debate because I'm not I'm not saying you're wrong, Bella. I'm just saying, you know, how do we deal with it? That's really a, a vital question. And what uh, you... Sorry, sorry. sorry no, go, go for it, Bella. I was just going to say, like, I, yeah, I, I completely agree, Patrick. Like, I, I know farmers and I know that it's not, it's absolutely not that they're trying to line their pockets. It's, it's especially to farm well it is an incredibly expensive uh thing to do and I completely agree that it's it's for government <laughs> you know we, we do need to be paying the the true cost of of these things and the impacts of that and it, and it is for government to make sure that you know across society we we have the means to make dignified choices and to, to have the food available to us that we need uh yeah and we can't we can't we can't perpetuate the system where we're just producing producing food terribly and then supermarkets are trying to just undercut each other to steal customers so no i i agree with what you're saying patrick but i'm not saying the answer i'm saying we have to sort of co-create the answer because this is this is all our challenge right now i was going to ask actually so in terms of like government support in terms of legislation in terms of policy is there a policy that exists already or that is in development or doesn't exist that each of you would like to see brought to life that 
you think would tackle some some element of our unsustainable system. Um, Ed, I'm going to come to you. Yeah, so I I am going to come at this from um, from the position that I'm paid to, the marketeer's perspective, and I'm going to advocate the Green Claims Code. The Green Claims Code is a reiteration by the government of existing advertising laws about sustainability claims, claims and sustainability, environmental claims. So um, I, I say I advocate it. Um, it's become a bit of a pain for me very quickly. I think I think what it's done is the government has has reiterated these um, these advertising laws, and it has in the process mobilised a legion of uh, armchair activists, for want of a better way of putting it, and people who are you know concerned parties who have been desperate to hold companies to account for their claims. And finally, we've been emboldened. And unfortunately, what, what's happened immediately is that it's the people who are, who, are, who are making the loudest claims who have come under fire. Quite often those claims are, are somewhat justified. So in the case of Innocent or Oatly, I feel like the ASA came down, the advertising standards people came down a little bit hard on them. But, um, you know, we're starting to see these claims being held over the coals. And I don't really use the G word, greenwashing, too much. But, um, but you know, we are finally starting to see the wood for the trees. And so, yeah, I would say from a marketer's perspective, the Green Claims Code is going to start making a difference in, in in helping companies walk the walk. I say helping, in a you know that's not too strong a word to use. I think there's there's a really good use of um, legislation that already exists. We've waited a long time for the Green Claims Code, and it can be used across anything, kind of any vertical, um, any kind of product. That if you think the the claims that it says on the packaging or, or on the website are not being met from an environmental way, um, or you yeah. it, you can't. Uh, it's not clear where the product is green or what it contains that is green, then you can challenge it. Um, yeah, so I think that's a real, that must be, a, a, I mean, I know you guys do everything right, but it's still a big shift, isn't it, for, for suppliers and retailers? It is, but it's very rare that you have an area of professional development so neatly laid at your feet. So I'm, I'm counting my blessings for that one. But I would say in terms of transparency, in terms of encouraging transparency, um, I'm really hoping that the, the talk of impact reporting becoming mandatory is uh, is going to come true um it was a recommendation from the gri task force a couple of years ago sadly their report was published in march 2020 and we all know what happened then so it's no surprises why that flew under the radar but um the government has just uh, recently published their responses to that so i'm going to dive through that and i'm hoping impact reporting is going to be it's going to be high on that agenda the problem with impact reporting per se is that it drives transparency but not necessarily performance so i'm waiting to see how that one shapes up we actually see a lot of that in the fashion industry. So there's a lot of transparent reports and not a lot of action. So um, yeah, definitely, definitely seen that in, in case. Um, Bella, what kind of, is there a policy out there that already exists or, or is incoming that we can kind of look forward to that could help us as a society move to a, a better food system or, or do we need to push and, and sort of come, start making uh, suggestions and start making noise of our own? You'll be sorry to hear I've just kind of scribbled down a bit of a shopping list um, but I'd, I would start by saying that that we, we are expecting and have been expecting for a while now uh, the white paper so the government response to the national food strategy that um, Henry Dimbleby and co um, put out uh, with some excellent recommendations in it and um, you know we'd we'd love to see that white paper contain a food bill that put legislation in place to really tackle issues with the food system at a whole system level. Um, there wasn't a food bill mentioned in the Queen's speech, so we're not feeling that hopeful that that would happen. Um, but but it, it's looking like maybe in Scotland and Wales, there might be food bills coming out to legislate at, at a national level for some of those changes. Um, but, you know, I think, I think we need a right to food. I think we need a real living wage and a proper welfare system so people can start to engage start to engage with you know be able to make dignified choices about the food that they're they're eating i think fossil fuels need to become uneconomic so you can't be kind of competitive through relying on those i think we need subsidies for sustainable production in farming which i think hopefully the new subsidy regime from defra is going to look like i'm still slightly worried that they might just 
they might just incentivize large landowners to to rewild their land and it and it might not look so much like sustainable production as sort of pretty countryside um and i think universal free school meals with with really good procurement standards and and local authorities uh to to be kind of funded and supported properly to be able to put those things through could be an incredible way to to start to make really positive food changes in a way that's not not kind of dumping the, the problem on on individuals but kind of at an institutional level you know all children could just have access to at least one hopefully more than one meal a day that's been procured to a really high standard and it's it's no sweat on the brow of their parents um so I think there's loads we could do uh and I think right to food would be a really exciting place to start but a little bit bit a little bit hard to get the the parliamentarians excited about that one <laughs> It, it feels like we've got a mountain to climb. Um, and, and Patrick, I mean, I'm guessing that you're, is, are you hoping bits of your report might end up being policy or influence policy? I mean, you, it, I know you're pretty close to policy makers. Um, you've probably got the best sort of view of what might be coming down the line in terms of uh, food policy that can help us. Well, um, to Ed's point about impact assessment, I do think it's very, very hard for people who buy food uh, today to know the story behind it. I think the, the labelling scheme is very confusing. And I think there is a lot, there's risk of a lot of greenwash. And I think the way to resolve that, and this would be, I so to your question about, you know, what, what could government do, not just governments, but others, what could be done, let's say this, to, to create conditions where regenerative and sustainable food systems would become much, much more prevalent. I think the first thing would be to measure sustainability using a common framework so that uh, every farmer and grower in the world use the same way of measuring the sustainability impacts of their farming system. And that wouldn't just include carbon and soil, it would include um, all emissions, it would include impact on water, um, on energy and resource use, uh, on biodiversity, on social and cultural impacts, on everything, but using exactly the same framework of categories and units of measurement. So you could literally translate that potentially uh, into a labeling scheme where you could buy, whether you bought an organic product or a you know, leaf product or any other product, you could still have a common language. So a bit like you have on you know, white electrical goods where you could look at its sustainability rating. I think that if that audit, sustainability audit was required by DEFRA, for instance, as a precondition for entering this new scheme, which is called ELMS, which is the Environmental Land Management Scheme, which has been festering around for about four years and nothing much has happened. Uh, and the DEFRA are utterly confused because they're lobbied lots of people about how to how to pay make the payments and I think so far they've got it largely wrong if that payment could be linked to a sustainability audit and DEFRA or the Welsh or the Northern Irish or the Scots would reward the outcomes of farmers moving towards more sustainable practices and if they put a lot more money into that and if the government supplied the polluter pays principle so that Farmers who use damaging practices are financially accountable for the impacts of whether it's on public health or water or anything else. And then if the finance community, the banks and the investment community started to offer farmers who've moved towards regenerative farming systems, um, lower interest rates or grants or, you know, just making sure that the financial win was behind the farmers who were moving towards those kind of systems and the regulators banned the worst practices i think you take all that together because what we've really got to do is if you think about it at the moment in farming the wrong thing pays and the right thing doesn't so if you farm sustainably you're almost certainly going to make less money than if you farm in an intensive way and exactly the same if you're a consumer of food the cheapest food is probably doing the most damage to the environment. The most expensive food, which you really would want to eat, is, is potentially the least affordable. So we have to reverse that. And we can do that with government, government intervention, sustainability auditing, banks intervention. And I think they're going to do this now, by the way. Um, and then finally, an empowering labelling scheme where you can use your buying choices uh, to be part of the solution. I do think we shouldn't underestimate the power of people buying food. But if everybody decided to 
choose food which was come from a proper sustainable farming system that the world would change it's just that too many of us you can understand why people buy cheap food you go into wherever tesco's or wherever and the food seems so cheap and if you buy something sustainable it maybe is three or four times the price and that's not an that's an on not an honest comparison so we need to move to a situation where food pricing is honest and where all those government interventions take place and if we did all that we could move quite quickly to an agricultural transition. Well, I think, um, A, I just want to applaud you and say, can you be in charge, please? Because I feel like all of that is made so much sense. And you can see the knock-on effects of each bit actually having a positive impact. Um, just a, a, a side note, there's a lot of people who have joined sort of halfway through um, and, and are still joining. Um, this is predominant, we've been talking predominantly about the UK and sort of European systems um, in terms of growing and, and UK uh, legislation, just because that's where, where, where Pebble is based, where the, where the panel are based. But I know a lot of you have been putting in the chat different ideas around um, legislation in different countries and what's going on. Um, and, and so please do keep putting that in the chat so we can kind of see it and we can pick up on ideas. Um, and I've got one more question for the panel, and then I'll throw it open. Um, no, I just add one question. about people in different countries, because I honestly think these issues, they're common to every mm. citizen and farmer in the world. So if you're a smallholder farmer in sub-Saharan Africa, and I've visited a few, what are you doing? You're looking after soil, building organic matter, managing water. And we've got too much of it in Wales, but, you know, a lot of people have got too little. It's still the same thing. And we're, we're, we're united, we're sort of brothers and sisters on the land, really. And this system of uh, sustainability auditing, you could have a common language which would literally be global. And I think that all these issues we're discussing are the same challenges wherever you are in the world. Uh, absolutely, and, and thank you so much for, for solidarity, isn't it? We're all in it together. Um, and I think as well for, for individuals and consumers, again, facing the same challenges. We um, share share soil we share water we, we're not independent where everything's connected it's so it's really so empowering to do that to feel that interconnectivity definitely and, and i'm i think we've, this is the most countries we've ever had on a on, <laughs> on a call which is fantastic so it's it's really exciting to see and, and there's been so many amazing suggestions in the in the chat as well of what's going on in different countries um, I've got one more question for the panel, and then I know we've got lots of questions, so I'm going to um, open it up to you guys to, to put your questions to the panel, so I'm sure you've got lots. Um, we've talked a lot about um, legislation, about what governments can do, about what the policies that we want to see coming in, and we've also talked a lot about consumer choice and actually price being a, a real barrier for more and more people at accessing a sort of more sustainable system. If people don't have the money to buy more sustainable food, what else can they do to help this system, systemic change? Is it petitions? Do they work? Is it getting in touch with your local political representative? Is it emailing and, and talking to the brands and seeing if you can push them to change? What, what do you think some of the actions that individuals can do that might that, you know, have a low cost and, and sort of outside of buying? Is it growing your own? Is it getting involved in a cooperative or community garden? You know, is it what what, what ways that people can actually start to play a part, a positive, active role in all of this? I'm going to jump in there and rub up the Thatcher fans the wrong way straight away and say <laughs> rebuild rebuild society. Look after your neighbours. Look after your friends. Um, growing your own is a great is a great way to access uh, not only the complexities of food systems. It, it it's certainly a bridge to that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's just about growing awareness and amalgamating support for each other. So I've got to admit, I actually struggled with this question and I wonder if it's because I work for a premium food brand. But, um, but yeah, don't be afraid to ask for help. It is the most empowering thing you can do is to ask someone for help and accept it. So I'm gonna start from that. That's a lovely, that's a lovely way to start. And, and I guess that help includes learning how to grow food, asking silly questions. Um, asking what brands are doing so that you can understand where their food is coming from. Yeah, I think that's, that's really lovely. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, I think it's I think it's all about building trust. I think that word trust cannot be underestimated, and that's what it's about. Building it's it's about consumers uh, choosing retailers they can trust, retailers choosing suppliers they can trust, and suppliers working in ways that they can trust and building building res resilience. There's as much resilience in diversity. Uh, in, in trust as there is in diversity in systems. So, so yeah, it's all about trust for me, the T word. Thank you. Um, Bella, 
what's what can people do oh well I really liked some of your suggestions Georgina I think as well um you know I think you know it can be it can be really hard to feel that way especially you know for the people who are having the hardest time at the moment but I think don't underestimate your power either and I think some of those points about um who you can reach out to that might be able to make wider change uh it can feel really daunting and you you know it, it won't always feel like you're the right person to do it but you absolutely are you know you're you're a person but you're a citizen of a country as well and you're part of a democracy and your voice deserves to be heard so if you know if you're able to go to your workplace or your kid's school or a local counsellor and say to them that this really matters to you and if you you know any of your neighbours feel the same and you say that this this really really matters um then that 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 could that could plant a seed and you know it's worth looking up I'll, I'll put some links in the chat but if there's a food partnership in your local area um then there might already be, be people doing this work that you can reach out to um and you can you can help them uh if you felt inclined uh because there are lots of brilliant campaigns there are lots of people working on this around the country trying to get better procurement in schools trying to get councils to commit to having food strategies trying to get uh commitments that people can have access to spaces to grow their own food and you absolutely can contribute to that um systemic change so believe in your voice and you know if you've got if you've got the time and if you've got the leisure to then um do make a stir uh I'll put I'll put a link in the chat about the food partnership so you can find out if you've got one you can get in touch with um Amazing. and I'll put my email in too thank you and that's that's a really good point as well no, none of us have to start from scratch there are so many people pushing for these every different aspect of, of making a food system more sustainable so it's about finding that tribe and finding people that you, you can work with um, rather than feeling like it's all on one person and you've got to sort of start from nothing. Um, it's, it's joining together. And Patrick, how, how do we help farmers? What's the best thing we can do as individuals to help uh, well, help champion and, and, and promote the, sort of the, the, the sustainable regenerative farmers or, or persuade more to, to become that way? Well, I do think a lot of the ideas that have been suggested are completely right. Uh, I think growing your own is really important because anybody can grow their own, even if you're in a, you've got a window box, you know, but if you've got a tiny back garden, it's incredible what can be grown where you are. I, somebody said composting. I do think that composting could change the world because actually, you know, composting is the sort of primary. Composting can change the world. Right? When it's soil yeah. building, <laughs> nature, they, it's speeding up nature's soil building process so we need to build soil and build healthy soil and composting accelerates that so that's a really powerful thing to do and i agree very much with bella about public procurement i think we should i think we shouldn't underestimate our collective community power when we argue for things because if you think about politicians never mind what persuasion they are all they really want to do is get re-elected and if we, if we right. Ooh. Patrick, you've gone on to mute somehow. Sorry, Patrick, I muted you by mistake. Sorry, oh. that was me. No. <laughs> if we really, you know, if politicians think that their electorate wants something, even if they don't agree with it, they'll probably do it. So I think we can use our citizen power to advocate for change. And I do think if all the parents said we demand good food in our schools from local and sustainable growers and we get public procurement which is a very good way of fast forwarding change because if you look at all the food that's eaten on the public plate including you know hospitals prisons the army care homes everything and schools of course it's huge and you know if people if even the local authorities said 10 percent of all the food that was going into the schools and places would be properly sustained resource from local producers. That would be massive because it creates a market. And I think a lot of farmers would change if they knew there was a market for their products. And don't just go plant-based, by the way. I know I said this before, but if you want a farmer in the East of England to change to a proper mixed farming sustainable system, they're going to have to introduce grass. 
So we need to buy the grass fed products from their livestock because the only way you can turn grass into food we can eat is with um, grazed livestock. So don't exclude meat. Don't say we've just got to go completely meat free if you want school meals. Say it must be meat from a sustainable farming system if you're not a vegetarian, of course. So I, I do think we can use people power to drive this change. And uh, that's probably the most, in the end, that's the only really lasting potent force, more important than anything else. Absolutely. I, I think there's been so many ideas there of like ways that we can get in touch, ways that we can we can make a difference through what we buy, through who we talk to, through asking for help, through focusing on our, our local communities. Um, there's been absolutely so much. And I know there's been so much um, appreciation and love for you all in, in the chat. There's some Jeff's in schools just in the chat. Brilliant. <laughs> there's a whole second uh, second debate going on in the chat. It's, it's fantastic. Um, I know there's been a lot of questions, so I'm going to try and get through uh, sort of four or five of them as, as sort of quickly as we can. I know we're coming up to eight o'clock, but if people are happy to carry on for another sort of 10 or 15 minutes, it'd be really lovely to have you because um, I know there's so much interest. Um, and I know there's so many other things that we could spend hours talking about and we haven't even touched on soil health. We obviously haven't touched on packaging or food waste, um, but this really was a chat about the more systemic uh, sort of ways of thinking and we'd love to sort of organise some other uh, panel talks later on in the year about all these different options given the the interest and the, the high level of everybody's knowledge as well which has been fantastic to see um i know uh, garnet you've had your hand up um <laughs> for a long time so do you want to ask your question uh yeah i'm in victoria in bc uh canada and um uh, we've got a couple of initiatives that we're uh, doing here. One is that the, we're really trying to reduce the um, the distance from uh, uh, field to table. Uh, here we've got um, we're working on urban agricultural solutions that just for local production and um, does helping to design uh, regenerative agriculture farms and. Uh, uh, we've got the uh, uh, provincial government now doing um, uh, land matching, sort of a, like a dating service between young farmers and people who have land which is not being utilized uh, um, for food production. And, um, and that is uh, creating opportunities. I think uh, that I would, one of the other problems that we've got is that uh, inspiring uh, the next generation to grow food and uh, uh, matching young uh, horticulturalists and people that are interested in, in, in food generation to, uh, with uh, owners of land that is not being utilized uh, is can make a big impact because we have to create a generation of new food growers as well. But uh, local food production, I think, is a big, big part of, uh, of the, the challenge. And I think it's a really big part of the opportunity. And uh, the technologies now I'm working with uh, some inventors. What one of the things that we've got at uh, Earthwalk is an innovation center, and I'm helping to develop uh, uh, projects that uh, uh, that uh, hydroponic food systems for urban agriculture that um, uh, combined with uh, uh, really advanced light frequency things, which can boost uh, uh, the rate at which food grows to the point where uh, uh, you can you can generate produce in a quarter of the amount of time that it takes in a field. Uh, so there's some really interesting um, developments in terms of the potential for urban agriculture that I think we have to be examined because if you can get that uh, um, you know field to table down to a few kilometers, it could make a huge impact and and uh, it's there's something a, I think it's an opportunity that's being missed. There's some really good um, statistics as well, talking about how many people um, are growing in urban in, in cities and how much and how many more of us will be living in cities in the next sort of decades. So I think it's a it's a really key area that we need to explore, isn't it? These micro farms and community gardens and hydroponics and vertical farms, um, where they fit in in, in that system. Um, is this something, Ed and and uh, what well, the, the whole panel really? Is it something? that you're working with, with some urban farmers in, in any way? My yeah, daughter, this is so urban, she grows in Dagenham for growing communities uh, in Stoke Newington. She grows all the salads and she's written a book on urban growing called Do Grow. That's Alice Holden. 
And uh, I, I think urban growing is incredibly important. And it's been estimated that uh, in terms of the sort of fresh foods that uh, salads and fresh uh, vegetables that could be grown, uh, some amazingly high percentage could be grown within the city limits and in peri-urban farms. Um, sorry, my enthusiasm got the better of me there. Um, uh, so yeah, I absolutely agree that uh, that yeah, uh, urban farming is 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 definitely holds a lot of excitement. Again, I think just be just for at, at, at its very basic level, it offers people an insight into what it takes to grow food. And I think when people realise that uh, you know when they start battling slugs and they start battling aphids and they think, oh, I could just reach for the, oh, hold on a minute, no, I'm not going to do that. And you start realising the expertise that goes into growing food in in you know in in, in the volumes that we eat. So very, very excitingly, we have uh, in a couple of days, or tomorrow actually, we are launching uh, a new line from Growing Underground. So when you walk down Clapham High Street and you see the big round concrete buildings, these weird windowless concrete buildings, those are actually the entrances to underground bunkers uh, where they have installed miles and miles of hydroponic systems. Now hydroponic systems are not, um, uh, are not necessarily more energy efficient. In fact, they use about four times as much energy as a, a field growing counterpart. But growing underground have left no stone unturned in creating the most efficient system that they can. So um, they use recycled carpet substrates. They use ultra efficient LEDs, a bit too efficient actually. The plants started growing in weird, weird, weird kind of wave wave uh, shapes. So they had to diffuse that that strength slightly. Um, but it's 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 a, it's a it's such an amazing operation, and we were just so impressed that they were using this disused space in such a productive way that we actually broke our organic sourcing policy to say, hey guys, come on board. So we're very, very excited to bring them on and, uh, and yeah, really looking forward to see what the future holds for, for urban, urban farming. Amazing. Georgina, I know there's lots of people with their hand up. I wonder if I could really quickly come in on one other thing that Garnet said. Yeah. Um, I find the, the point about the next generation of, uh, of growers and about having land for them is a really interesting point. And I don't know, I don't know what it's like in Canada, but here in the UK, uh a thousand years ago we 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 got a new king and he gave the land to a few of his mates and the way the land was divided up then hasn't changed very much in those thousand years so a lot of our land is still really concentrated in the hands of people um who aren't necessarily using it either in the most environmentally friendly way or in the most um sustainably productive way either so there's a really interesting leverage point there from a uk perspective about how we can start to break up some of that concentrated land ownership to free up land that's currently being used as hunting grounds and all kinds of things and turn it into sites for agroecological production for a next generation that comes with a lot of need for training and capital input and, and and knowledge to be shared as well you know you can't just give someone land and tell them to run with it but it's a really really interesting and important aspect um, of, of that question I think that's One brilliant. of the advantages that we have here is that the um, there's a tax incentive uh, for our landowners if they um, are generating more than twenty five hundred dollars a year in income from uh, agricultural uh, produce, then uh, they get a huge tax advantage. So we can approach them with a young farmer that wants to to work their land uh, with an immediate. Uh, uh, a financial benefit, which is incentivize the conversion of land that's sitting fallow into productive uh, uh, use. So, uh, creating those kind of uh, incentives, I think, are critical to in terms of public policy to facilitate that as incentives for urban agric agriculture, uh, incentives for regenerative agriculture, incentives for for young farmers, incentives for land use use that's uh, or uh, dedicated to uh, to food. Uh, you know, that kind of public policy is the things that we've got to keep working on. I think. I think that's a brilliant idea. We should have some sort of, we should launch a similar scheme here this in the UK, where um, landowners who, you know, devote 5% of their land or whatever it is to encouraging young, young people to take on growing or, you know, uh, agroecological farming systems, uh, get sort of either a financial reward, a tax break or something, and the banks could do the same thing. They could uh, incentivize uh, their own um, clients who are farmers uh, who have got lots of land to bring in young people and they could, they could give incentives for that, financial incentives. I think those two ideas would be really good. 
Definitely. It's, it's all about like going back to working together, isn't it? And, and just changing up the status quo and the system that we've already got and, and thinking in a different way. Um, I'm going to just move on from that, even though it's like we could spend hours talking about that. And I would encourage anyone that is interested in carrying this conversation on, if you're not a member of our Pebble uh, Ripples community, to go and join. Um, Sarah's got the link and she's put it in the chat a few times as well, because th these conversations can carry on there as well. And you can find people to connect with and you can find people to um, share these ideas with and work together as well. Um, we have members from all over the world. So um, so do, do check that out. Um, I've got three questions um, from three uh, amazing people in my screen. Um, so I'm going to go through those. And if we can, I'm going to say we'll, we'll keep it quite short um, and then we'll kind of carry uh, conversations on elsewhere um, if, if we need to. And we can always um, connect you to the panellists as well, um, if you would like. So I was going to say, um, uh, I've got Erna, I'm sorry, Erna, Erna Beden. <laughs> sorry, I was trying to read it and do something at the same time. <laughs> Hello, I'm Erna Bidin. Uh, from uh, Ghana this moment, actually, I'm, the, I'm Dutch, but oh. I'm, I was Indonesian, <laughs> so it's complicated living in Africa. So I just want to, to comment about uh, talking about urban farming, then a uh, number of people talking about this. And of course, I know so the Netherlands, we have limited area to grow. Yeah. So uh, in 2018, I, I was uh, in the conference of vertical agriculture in the Netherlands. So it was really very amazing, but only for the rich country, for the rich people, because you have to use light, et cetera, et cetera. But fortunately, I have found in Indonesia, they have developed vertical agriculture without light. So because you use outside, let's say because we are, we are in the tropic, right? And then of course, during uh, uh, summer in Europe also, there's kind of light, a lot of thing. But actually the point during the meeting, during the conference last time, they said, uh, the leader said, I would like to bring people not using inside of the house, but all the buildings up there, make a small garden, grow something there. Now we can link also into hydroponic yeah very simple hydroponic can make you can make by yourself the ingredient and all my friends fortunately i did my agriculture in indonesia for the for my bachelor and my master and phd in netherlands so they created their own uh, uh, hydroponic so everybody can use that yeah it's not necessary to wait for the, uh, the people who, the industry to manage everything. Yeah, because we are not having food shortage, right? Why we have to wait? There are so many things. I'm from climate reality, uh, 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 hope, yeah? So I also learned about that. And in Africa, it was really terrible, hot, and people are hungry. And we try, I'm from agriculturists, so we try to make it happen that people can eat. The land is not fertile anymore. And then we also, I would like to create this vertical agriculture using step-by-step. Step. And then we can learn about how to make the hydroponic then teach people, the resource poor farmers, how to grow to improve their, uh, their, their uh, of course, their soil fertility as well as the food system. And we also, at this moment, we introduced Sweet potato, probably in UK, you like sweet potato, no orange fresh sweet potato. Dr. Mary Robinson, Robinson, I remember the former uh, president of, of, of Ireland started to promote that in 28, 29, 2013, I was there. Then, then she brought into uh, a conference in, in London, 26, 2013 in June. And I was busy to put my, 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 my logo in the big square in London, telling eat sweet potato, eat orange sweet potato, something like that. So, so, and sweet potato is the local of food for people here, but in, in Africa, but they neglect it. They said, if you are rich, you don't eat sweet potato anymore because it's for poor people. But if you are here, then you need pizza. 
you need spaghetti, something like that. So we try to change the mindset of people. So we also try to, to bring into the climate change, yeah? Because mm -hmm. sweet potato cannot be, can be, cannot be kept in a hot area up to two weeks. So we also look at local knowledge. Yeah, bring the local knowledge, put the sweet potato in the sand. Yeah, dry sand, clean sand. So they could, they could keep that up to seven months in here in Africa with 47, 40, 42 degrees Celsius outside. It's very, very, very hot. So this is what I want to, 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 let's say, to share with you that we don't have food anymore. What we are doing and the climate has become climate reality as it changed in crisis. So there's practical agriculture. It's not necessary to use light inside of the, you, you put in the, in the terrace. You are living in the, in the uh, uh, you don't have big house. You live in the flat, but you have small room behind that. Then with the pot, with the hydroponic system, you can change whatever. Sweet potato can be grown also. One of that step of food is energy, food, and, and, and also a, a full, uh, uh, there is a super food, let's say, everybody knows it here. And so you can just change the system a little bit in your house. Yeah. I think that's a really good, I think that's a really good point. And, and, and like um, what we were saying as well, like everyone can just, okay, it's not just, sometimes it's not as easy to just start, but there are always yeah. things that we can do and working with your local community. Yeah. As yeah, well, yeah. is super important across and, and across the world, and taking that knowledge to different um, landscapes and different um, communities. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I'm going. I know that a lot of you have come from the Climate Reality um, Project as well, so I'm, I'm super thankful that you guys are here. Um, just because I am conscious of time, and I, I want to get these two questions in because um, people have had their hands up for ages. I'm just going to move on um, to Jessica. I know you've had your hand up as well. Um, do you want to ask the question that you've got? Yeah, it's a, hopefully a quick one. Um, I was just really inspired by composting can change the world comment and um, thinking about community growing and just thinking that, you know, actually we need community composting. And um, do you guys know of organizations that are doing composting and maybe even farming net farmers networks who would accept composting from um, from towns and from, you know, local um, restaurants and that sort of thing so that we can actually, yeah, get, get everybody composting. So I, I, I haven't, sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I'll just very quickly say, I know there's an amazing composting project in the city of San Francisco where all the uh, green waste is uh, composted and applied to ranch land in Northern California. I also know an even more inspirational project in Egypt uh, run by a community called Sekem, um, where they've reclaimed huge areas of desert land using just compost and Nile water, but a lot less Nile water than would be the case if it was fertilised with chemical fertilisers. So, so I think we should have community composting projects at scale uh, in all the cities of the UK, and maybe you know some, Ed. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> that was off of mute. Um, so I, uh, unfortunately, again, know none in the UK, but I had this exact same, exact same thought the other day for using for, for um, disposing of compostable packaging in in the correct manner, because God knows that's causing uh, you know a massive problem at the moment. So um, you know, again, to to, to look further abroad, um, in Delhi, they have an amazing system where they uh, they have these uh, these beautiful terracotta pots that sits in people's homes. And these are every day kind of taken out of the city and applied to farmland. And it's about linking that food waste from the city with the, the, the falling amount of nutrients in, in farmland. And it's just about joining up that, that, mm. that dot, uh, that, that's, you know, making that link. But the link was, um, you know, making something quite aesthetic that people could then put in their houses that they wouldn't mind sitting in the corner of their kitchen. So it's, um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't know any in the UK, but I am keeping a, you know, a real uh, close ear out. Go on, Bella. There's definitely, definitely, definitely a community compost scheme in Brighton and Hove. I'll share a link in the chat. And I know that there are other ones that exist. And I, I'm trawling through my emails in the background just trying to remember where they are. Um, I haven't found them, but I'll put my email again in the chat, um, Jessica. That'd be amazing. Um, to let you know, where are you based out of interest? No, you don't have to tell me that. Send me an email. 
one. So in the chat, uh, the Brighton and Hove one, so, uh, which is a really good in, model. In my town, and I know we're both on, well, we are both on the sea. And one thing I, I live in a flat over overlooking the sea. And the one thing I get very frustrated is I've got nowhere to put compost. I, I don't, mm. I've got not enough pots that would take it. So I'd love to be able to, to combine it with other people and, and, and have it used um, communally. And I think so many people will have the goodwill and it goes back to that waste you know getting rid of waste in systems as Bella was saying linking up broken bits of other systems as, as Ed was saying and, and sort of pulling it all together and I think compost is a, is a fantastic way to start and what a brilliant um uh it's a metaphor for everything that we're doing so breaking things down and making good of making new things um, I think the um I think the, the, the NGO to look up is daily dump I've just seen it but again it comes back <laughs> to that we yeah, not a phrase to use lightly. Um, it's uh, it's but again, it comes back down to you know building that trust, building building that that society. I don't think we can we can wait for government to step in and, and especially not this government. They everything they do is everything they do is designed to fail. But the um, you know if we if we can get these, nothing's gonna nothing nothing's gonna happen unless we make it happen. So mm -hmm. you know if you're if you're the kind of person who thinks well this is a good idea we need we need to do this, then let's do it. Be the one in your community to put that system together. Well, you know that phrase, and I'm probably going to mangle this very badly, but you know, everything, nothing changes until everything changes, or something like that. You know, we all just have to to to, to start making whatever changes we can. We have one very last question from Anna. Um, Anna, I'm going to ask you to keep it fairly short, um, just so that we can get a quick answer from all the panels, and we can wrap up and let everyone get on uh, with their well sunset here. So, um, hopefully, whatever time of day it is where where you are. Um, what's your question, Anna? Oh, Anna, you are not on mute. You've got a hand up. Let me know if you want to put your question in the chat and I can ask it for you if you don't want to ask um, a question. No? Okay, don't worry. Um, I don't think you're on mute but maybe um you put your hand up and then gone and made a cup of tea or something i'm not sure um guys before we i know we could be here all evening and i put in the world to rights and it feels like actually collectively building the right food system that we all want there's so many amazing ideas um coming through from the panelists and actually from you all um it, it's actually fantastic to see um i would really encourage you if you're not a member of the pebbles ripples community to go and join or to join up to one of our newsletters on pebblemag.com so that we can keep this conversation going and we can keep the ideas um sharing them around with all of you uh absolutely fantastic people um bella where can people find you um in terms of sustain and in terms of of your work if they want to follow up uh, I'll pop my email and LinkedIn and the website in the chat now really quickly. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, Ed, obviously, um, Abel and Cole is all over social media. Is it? It's just at Abel and Cole, I believe, isn't it? It is. Yes. And it's the word and not the ampersand. So it's a a Abel, A-N-D, Cole. Lovely. And it's A-B-E-L. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely fantastic. And we'll be looking forward to hearing more about the um, Growing Underground project. Um, I can't wait to, to um, see that, actually. Um, I'm going past uh, that part of London in a couple of days, so I shall um, be thinking about what's underground. Um, Patrick, um, how can people find, follow the work of the Sustainable Food Trust? What would be best uh, to do? Uh, visit our website, follow us on Instagram, Sus Food Trust, but visit our website and sign up to our newsletter which is free, of course. And also we've got a daily news bulletin. And there's some really great stuff on our website. We produce occasional reports. The one I mentioned earlier will be up fairly soon. And um, yeah, if you can, you can learn more about, as I said, us on the, my farm in West Wales, where we produce cheese. And also what we are doing is, and we want to spread this more wildly, widely, we, we want farms to become educational stages because we think the best way to spread knowledge about farming, whether it's a, a farmer or a young person or just somebody wanting to learn more about the story behind their food is to visit the farm. So we want farms to become educational stages. And we're doing that on our farm in Wales. We've converted a threshing barn into a place where people can come and have meetings. So I think that's a really important way to um, reconnect with food and farming on farms on the ground. That's a really lovely way. And instead of farms being locked off places where people don't know what goes on, I think that's that's really fantastic. And hopefully we're going to be doing some pieces um, covering the report when it comes out, um, Brilliant. including Britain report. So um, again, watch out 
um, for that next month. Um, and just as a, as a one last thing, this has been part of our sea change um, uh, content journey. It started in April. We've been talking about soil health and permaculture, and we will carry on talking about soil health and permaculture and farming systems to the end of June. So if this is your bag, uh, make sure you sign up for our um, sea change newsletter, which comes out once a week with all of this lovely stuff um, talked about in it. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, thank you very much to our panelists um, who have absolutely blown me away with it. I just want you all in charge right now. Um, I hope you have a wonderful evening. Um, the record, if you want to watch this back, will be available um, in the Pebble community um, in a couple of days time. Um, so you can download that and you can share it around if you want or re-watch it if you've had a lovely time. Um, but other than that, have a lovely evening, everybody. Thank you very much.